Okay, so to get some, uh, gain some time, so welcome to the second of the series of the Salam Lectures in uh, 2015 from Don Zagier. <clears throat> so you've heard the first lecture yesterday, and just so the term is, uh, is the magic of uh, modular forms, and uh, every day has a different sub-subject uh, that uh, Don is writing at the moment for each of the days. So yesterday was in general applications for arithmetic. Today is a modular forms and application for differential equations and the irrationality of uh, Z, uh, zeta three. And um, then he will go on tomorrow and the next two days on different applications of the, of the um, modular forms. If I can, I remember if I can, um, I think tomorrow it will be about applications to black holes, if it is correct. Yes, oh, no. maybe <laughs> that will be on Thursday. So, and so every day, the good thing is that every lecture can be self-contained. So in that sense, uh, uh, we can restart every day and, 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 and try to follow up. Yes, it's the fourth lecture of application to string theory in black holes. <clears throat> so let me just remind you that uh, this series of lectures this year we have been uh, fortunate to get the funding from the KFAS, which is the Kuwait Foundation of, for the Advancement of Science. So now I'll let you with uh, Don. Topics disappeared mysteriously from the website. So many people asked me what I was going to do, and I said it was all written, but it has somehow gone into cyberspace. So I've written the five titles. So I start by saying that I'm very happy that many of the people who were here yesterday came back anyway, and that some people who weren't here yesterday came, showing that ignorance can be bliss. So remember the two most important things from yesterday. Uh, well, no, there were three most important things. One is that since I use the blackboard, people in back might want to come forward because I shout, I do my best, but I won't use the computer. In fact, maybe somebody could even turn it off. Uh, and I just will use the blackboard and my voice. So the two important things were that the letter tau is not Z. And so if I say Z, please correct me. And the other, I'm sure nobody has forgotten and you've all already done it, but by the... Okay, so, so today my theme, as you can read it here, MF is modular forms. Oh, I should have written it out at least once. The magic of modular forms is my general title, and to me the magic has both aspects. One is the one I tried to emphasize yesterday, that these very simple functions, in a certain sense, have two completely different aspects, which are not obviously the same, and that that somehow makes them very rich. And also that it gives you a kind of an automatic tool to prove many, many identities that you couldn't prove in a direct way. So we saw many examples yesterday, and there will be more tomorrow, today. In some sense, that's today's theme. But the other magic you see illustrated in this list, which as I said yesterday, is just a selection of five topics that I happen to like because I've worked on them, but I could have easily found another five disjoint from this list and probably a third five disjoint from both lists. So the magic is that these things that start as being a very, very specific class of functions invented by people like uh, Poincaré and Fuchs, and they look like very specific functions, but they come up in every domain of mathematics and more and more in recent years in every domain of or many domains, at least, of theoretical physics. So in conformal field theory or many other fields, there are many things that I won't mention here at all or just maybe a sentence in passing. So today, the connection is between modular forms and differential equations. Differential equations is surely one of the most central themes in all of mathematics, probably historically, the most important part of mathematics as far as applications in physics goes. I mean, certainly in Newtonian and the 19th, 18th and 19th century physics, but still in 20th century physics, and of course in mathematics. And there the amazing thing to me 
is the following. When modular forms were invented, which was, I mean, it was a very, very slow process. You can see traces of them in the paper of Gauss in the, in the first half of the 19th century. But something that resembles what we know really started in the late 19th century. And the people uh, were, uh, well, I mean, I don't know in any particular order, Weber, Fricke, and Klein, who one often ends together because they wrote several books together on elliptic and on multiple forms. Of course, Poincaré, Fuchs, and various other people. Fuchs is, of course, also very famous for, specifically for differential equations. And the whole field in those years was part of the theory of linear differential equations. And people studied it because they were interested in you know, triangle groups and special monodromic groups of special differential equations. And then somehow that aspect of the theory disappeared out of the collective consciousness to the extent, I mean, I've often told this story, so friends of mine in the audience will have heard me say this before, but about, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, or maybe a little more, I gave a lecture in a very top uh, European university, in fact, in Orsay, with maybe 80 or 100 people there, all very good number theorists. It was a specialized lecture for experts on multiple forms. And I simply asked, I said, it's a basic fact that all multiple forms satisfy linear differential equations. Just out of curiosity, how many of you know that fact? Please raise your hand. And there were zero. And that included Serre in the audience had actually written about it, but in a very different language. He said, but surely, Sarah, you know this. No, he said, that's new to me. I said, of course you know, but maybe you didn't recognize. But it so disappeared that what was originally the, the origin of the subject, the essence, people didn't, even the experts no longer knew it was even true. I mean, a few, but uh, you know, really very, very few. And in the last years, it's become much more popular, in particular, because in uh, theoretical physics, in particular in string theory, where you look at a mirror symmetry, for instance, and families of Calabi-Yaus, they have associated differential equations, which are the so-called Picard-Fuchs differential equations. I think, I hope I'll say something about. And those frequently turn out to be the same, frequently, unfortunately not, but frequently they're the same as the differential equations coming from multiple forms. So that's one reason people have started getting interested again. And another, I think, was in fact this uh, irrationality of Zeta of three, which is a story I'll tell uh, today. But to me, this was really incredible. If you think of the functions you learn about as a student, as an undergraduate, so you start with functions like you know, e to the x, log, well, first, of course, polynomials. And then you have slowly more and more transcendental functions, maybe the gamma function. And then depending on, on uh, whether you have an, an old-fashioned upbringing like me or a modern one, you may or may not see things like Bessel functions and Hermite polynomials and so on. And at least when I was a student, or classically, certainly also in the 19th century, one distinguished two broad classes of functions, the good ones and the bad ones. The good ones would be these. These all satisfy a differential equation. So for me, a differential equation will mean, when I say just differential equation, I'll mean a linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients. So, well, this one is sort of really stupid because I guess xy prime is 1. Uh, and here, there's a famous second order equation, of course, the hypergeometric function, a, b, c, x, and many, many others. And if you, but so, so all of these functions have differential equations here, second order, here, second, here, second, and this one does not. So this was considered the next level of the hierarchy. So essentially, all mathematicians distinguish a function that doesn't have a linear differential equation from one that does as the basic classification of all functions. And then you have the specialists in the whole field of multiple forms, and not a single one even knows that their functions all have a differential equation. So it's not only not the central point of view, they don't even know it. I mean, it's somehow very, to me, that's, I, I wanted to make that remark because it's somehow a little strange. So we won't see Bessel functions, but we will see the hypergeometric function. Well, these functions are somehow too, too not the right sort. So that's, uh, that's one thing. I wanted to say. So actually, it's even better. There are two kinds. Every modular form not only satisfies the differential equation, but actually two very different kinds. And so I'm going to explain both kinds. So there are two main theorems, theorem A and theorem B. Maybe I can already write them. And then I'll actually want to prove both of them. So theorem A. So first of all, since not everyone was here yesterday, and certainly people who are here yesterday 
will be more confused than people who weren't here yesterday. So let me remind you very briefly that a multiple form, in the correct way of thinking of it, so to speak, a multiple form f of tau f is a holomorphic function with some growth condition that I'm not going to write down again, from h to c. So it's a complex value function. h is the upper complex half plane, so that means imaginary part of tau. Tau is always the variable, unless I forget, and in z. It's a function uh, such that for all a, b, c, d in the group gamma, which in my lecture yesterday, but today it'll be less and less so, gamma is the group SL2z of two by two matrices with determinate one integer entries, a, b, c, and d are integers. And I'll put here for today, or a subgroup of finite index. Yesterday was the first day I didn't want to emphasize that, but already yesterday, some of the examples I gave, I said, actually, you know, this is not really on SL2z, it's on a subgroup of index 12. But today, most of the examples will be on subgroups. So, and then it satisfies this famous equation that for every such matrix, A, B, C, D, but in the case of SL2z, you only need these two matrices, usually called S and T, because they generate the group, so it's enough to check it for two matrices. And then the famous uh, equation is that the function is not simply invariant by gamma, so it does not simply satisfy f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d equal to f of tau. That is also interesting. It's called the modular function. So, but in general, there's a, f a formula, a c tau plus d to the k, and I'll put here, here k is an integer or sometimes a half integer, uh, is called the weight of f, so it's a basic invariant. So each modular form has a weight, but there are many, many modular forms, of course, of the same weight. They form a vector space. If you fix the group, it's a finite dimensional vector space. So that's called the weight. And what else did I want to say? Yeah, if k equals zero, in which case you have to relax the growth condition in some way, then uh, f is called a modular function rather than a modular form. So a form is really, in a fancy modern language, a section of some line bundle over the modular curve. And if it's the trivial line bundle, it's just a complex valued function, then it's just a function. A form is a little fancier. OK, so that's the language of modular functions and modular forms. Just to remind you, please. OK. Uh, well, it doesn't make sense. So let's take this equation, f of, uh, you know, we have this c tau plus d to the k. So if you have a complex number, and if you're a mathematician, not a physicist, then if you have a number which is an integer, you know what z to the k is. But if k is not an integer, you don't know what z to the k is. If you're a physicist, you probably do know because you choose some branch of some log and you cut the plane. But that's no longer a function. You can't cut up the plane. So we simply don't have well-defined k powers. For instance, even, I said that k is allowed. It's a good question, but I'm explaining even a half. I said very cavalierly, for instance, I gave the example, the fate of tau is, that was the function so this is good anyway, because I'll need these functions in a moment. Q was always e to the 2 pi i tau. And I had this very simple theta function, the sum Q to all square powers. And this was some kind of a modular form, I told you, of weight a half. But there's actually a problem, or I gave another example. Well, I'll stay with this for the moment. Uh, what does it mean to have weight a half? Well, in particular, it means in this case, uh, let me take the function theta 3 of tau, which is the same thing, but I divide here by 2. OK, so that's uh, just a reshift. This is a multiple form on a group called gamma of 2. I'll define it in a minute. So there, there's no problem, because q to the n squared over 2 makes sense, because it's e to the pi i n squared tau. And you can exponentiate any complex number. But now, when I write, for instance, this theta 3 of minus 1 over tau, well, it should satisfy tau to the one half, maybe with some funny constant. But actually, the problem is, what does this mean? I mean, tau is a complex number. It has two square roots. One of them is the negative of the other. It's not a well-defined function. So uh, there is a way around it. In the case of half integral weight, there's an elaborate theory developed by Shimura and other people. And so you can make sense. But a priori, k has to be an integer just to make sense of this kth power. 
And it really will give a problem, even if k is a half or a third. Of course, you can pick some, some root, like the standard root, because we're in the upper half plane. But then there won't be any such function, because when you take the important thing is that this was a group action. If I take f of gamma tau, then it's invariant. But if I take f of gamma 1, gamma 2 tau, then I can think of this in two ways, as f of gamma 1 of gamma 2 of tau, or as f of gamma 1 times gamma 2 of tau, because it's a group action. If I do it this way, I'll get something times f of tau coming from gamma 1, gamma 2. But if I do it this way, I'll get something times f of gamma 1 tau, gamma 2 tau, excuse me, and that will be something else times f of tau. So in either case, I'll get a transformation. But these things won't agree, because in complex numbers, it is not always true, even if you pick the standard square root, that the square root of AB is the square root of A times B. But it is true that if K is an integer, then AB to the K is A to the K, B to the K. So in other words, the consistency of this equation essentially requires K to be an integer. And the only reason I can allow half integer, it's a very tricky theory with co-cycles and the metaplectic group. I don't want to talk about it. There's a trick. But basically, you must have an integer. I hope that's a good answer. No, that's what I just explained. I spent five minutes explain. I just spent five minutes to explain. No, we require this for every A, B, C, D. And you can't choose all the branches because that's what I was explaining. I said, of course, you can choose a branch for each number at random. But then this won't be true. And therefore, this consistent, that's exactly my whole explanation. f of gamma 1, gamma 2 is something times f of tau. But you've chosen a branch. But f of gamma 1, gamma 2 is also f of gamma 1 of gamma 2 of, of tau. So it will be something times f of gamma 2 tau. Applying it again, it's something else times f of tau. These two equations won't agree because this is not true if you choose random branches. And there's no way, believe me, there's no way to make them agree. The space of forms will always be zero dimensional. They will not exist. Sure, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but that's because you're, you're, I'm doing a global thing, and that's, I, I don't want to get into a very technical discussion coming from conformal fields, but here we have global fields. They're defined in the whole upper half plane. It's absolutely essential. It's not defined in some small area. And I'm simply telling you as a fact, and please simply believe me, it would take 10 minutes to give you a complete proof. This equation will not have any solution even if k is a half integer, unless you do something very tricky. And for fractional indices, it simply won't work. So simply, you won't get any function. This is, remember, for all a, b, c, d in the group, and for all tau in the upper half plane, not in a little neighborhood of a point where you choose something. And it just won't work. There aren't any functions. So you can make the definition, but you will get only the zero function. It's really true. I'm, I'm not trying to you know, sweep over a difficulty. It's simply that it, it won't work. So that's why it's a very good question. I mean, of course, it's why does k have to be an integer or sometimes a half integer? So now let me say the two main theorems. So we've already seen that a modular form is a function of tau. But as we also saw yesterday, if I look at these two things, these two generators, then one of them says f of minus 1 over tau. If tau is an integer, uh, should be simply tau to the k f of tau. But this one, so this is this matrix. And again, if you have the two equations I'm writing, suffice, because these two matrices generate the group. So we have two functional equations. This is very simple. It's just an involution. So it's an even function under some involution. The other is also very simple. It's just a translation by one. So each group is an abelian group. This is the group Z. This is the group of order two. But together, they, they give you this uh, co the more complicated group. OK. So uh, but because of this fact, as I explained yesterday, any function which is a function of tau plus 1, you can also think of as a function of q, which is e to the 2 pi tau. Because by order's identity, q only depends on tau up to translation by 1. So you can think of every modular form. I'll never write f of q, but I'll write f of tau, but I'll certainly write its Fourier expansion, which we talked about a lot yesterday. That's where the applications come from. And that will be a power series not in tau, but in q. We're not a... a expanding around tau equals zero. We couldn't. It's not a, a regular point. But around q equals zero, which in tau is the point at infinity. So now there are two theorems, two basic theorems. One is the tau point of view. It's very simple to state. And as far as I know, completely very simple to prove. And as far as I know, completely useless. But it's a very nice theorem. So every modular form. I'm always using capital MF for modular form is here, so I won't write it out each time. Every modular form of any weight uh, 
is satisfies. I have one more uh, abbreviation I'd like to make. It's very, very standard in mathematics, and it's such a long phrase. Please forgive me if I write differential equations. I'll write DE because it takes too long. But it's pretty standard. Everybody knows, you know, ODE, PDE, so ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, maybe LDE for linear. I won't use any of them, but I will use DE. So it satisfies an LDE, which I'll write out the linear. Oh, sorry, except I would write it if it were true, but I won't write it because it's false. A nonlinear differential equation of, and now comes the surprising thing. So this is now with respect to the original variable, with respect to tau. So f a priori is a function of tau, and now the surprising thing is that that equation always is the same order. It's always order of three, never more, also never less, as it happens, unless it's the constant, I guess. So that's a very nice theorem. And in fact, it's even better uh, if I had colored chalk, which I do, then I would insert a word, which I will. Uh, well, I have to insert an N also because I'm writing in English, an autonomous. I didn't want to put it first because maybe not everyone knows the word. Let me remind you of the terminology very briefly uh, in case it's either non-standard or you're not familiar with it. It's fairly standard. So when I say uh, so when I say a linear, uh, which I usually won't say, a linear differential equation, so I have a function y, which is a function of x. So this means, or let, let's just call it f of x. Then this means that there's an equation, a linear differential equation of order n. I should define that too because I use the word. It means that among the first capital N derivatives of f, there's a linear relation whose coefficients are, for me, just polynomials to keep life simple. Although actually in the theorem b, the more general statement, you would allow algebraic functions rather than polynomials. But I'll avoid that. So linear differential equation means this. So in other words, it's a combination of x. It's polynomial in x of arbitrary degree. But it's linear in f, f prime up to the nth derivative. A nonlinear differential equation, as in theorem a, is simply of a polynomial in several variables, again of order n. You have a polynomial, a fixed polynomial with constant coefficients, just complex coefficients, in n plus 1 variables. And this function, if you substitute for the n plus, n plus 2 variables, excuse me, you substitute in at x, f and its derivatives, so the 0 up to the nth derivative, it's identically 0 as a function of x. So this is a polynomial. And it's called autonomous. It's not very important, but just it's a well-known word, and it happens to be true for free in this theorem. If this polynomial if the coefficients of this polynomial, so I could also say polynomial in the derivatives whose coefficients, like here, are polynomials in x. But if the coefficients are constant, that means we simply have a polynomial relation among the derivatives with no x at all, then it's even simpler. Well, in a typical equation would be I already mentioned, e to the x satisfies y prime equals y. That's linear, of course, but it's also autonomous. But a Bessel function wouldn't. You'd have some x, y double prime equals something. OK, so those are just the words. So that's theorem B. And as I said, as far as I know, it's useless. I don't know any direct consequence of this general theorem. And the reason it's useless is because of this uh, innocent looking word, non. Linear differential equations have a very, very rigid theory with monodromy and beautiful properties. Nonlinear, there are wonderful parts of mathematics that are all about nonlinear equations, but there's no theory that you can just throw your equation into and get an answer. You have to study each class individually. It can be very hard. I mean, think of Perelman's work and, and things like that. I mean, it's, uh, nonlinear equations are notoriously difficult. And here, maybe, if some serious nonlinear uh, differential equations people studied this, maybe they could say things, and maybe it's even happened in the in the early 20th century and has become forgotten. I'll mention one nonlinear equation that was used. But so far as I know, you can't really make much hay out of this. But theorem B is, let me write it out now more carefully. Let f be a modular form of some weight k. But now I do want the weight to be, first of all, an integer, not a half integer, and positive. Strictly positive. In English, positive means strictly bigger than zero. Weight k. 
And let T be a modular function. So remember, a modular function is a modular form of weight zero. You can ask, does it have to be on the same group? I, I can answer, well, it's automatic, because each one is on some subgroup of finite index of SL2Z, and then they're both modular on the intersection of those which still have finite subgroups. So for all the difference it makes on the same group, OK? And now, then the claim is F satisfies, and now it's much, much better, a linear, this time, differential equation. But it's worse in two re three respects. Uh, two respects. First of all, it's not autonomous. That's not a big deal. In fact, it would be totally boring if it were linear and autonomous. It would just be a sum of exponential functions, and it certainly isn't. It's a linear equation, but now the order is no longer always 3. The order is k plus 1, exactly k plus 1. Uh, so it now does depend on the weight, but that's why k had to be an integer. Order of 3 halves wouldn't make too much sense. But now it's respect to t, not to tau. So this is quite remarkable, and as I say, that's that's the theorem we'll really use, but I'm going to prove both, or at least sketch the proof of both, because they're both not too hard and very pretty and very enlightening, I think. So those are the two basic facts. And it's the second one that was so important in the 19th century and got forgotten. But I mean, the first one got forgotten too, but it deserved it. OK, so that, those are the statements. So I want to put meat into this now by telling you why they're true and how it works and examples, and then the beautiful application found by Burkers to the irrationality of zeta of 3. So I'll just, as advertising for later, in 1978, Apéry, who was a relatively unknown French mathematician, became an extremely well-known French mathematician immediately after that, proved a problem that had been open. Euler had already mentioned that zeta of 3, of course, is what people call, for some reason, the Riemann zeta function that Euler invented 110 years earlier. And it's simply the sum of the reciprocals of the integers to the power you see, so in this case, the cubes. So zeta 3 is simply the number 1 plus an eighth plus a 27th, which is approximately 1.20205, I think, 6903, I forget. And already Euler, who found that zeta of 2 and zeta of 4 and zeta of 6 could be given by closed formulas, said he couldn't find a formula for zeta 3, and he believed there wasn't one. So that was in 1849. And in 1978, uh, 1749, what am I saying? So it took you know, 230 years until it was proved that this number, maybe it can be expressed in terms of some other numbers, but at least it's not rational. But about one year later, so around 70, I think 79, Berkers, it was a very mysterious proof, very ad hoc. Nobody understood, actually nobody even quite understood why it was true. There was, he gave such a bizarre presentation of the proof that people doubted it, and actually people asked me to prove the key identity he claimed, and I did prove it. And, and then everyone believed it, but it was, of course, his, his identity, his thing. But anyway, the proof was very mysterious. Even with the proof, you didn't understand where the ideas came from. And then Burkers found an interpretation of Apéry's proof using this connection with modular, with modular forms and differential equations. So that's what I'll explain later. But first, I want to talk about theorems A and B. So the first thing is, if you talk about differential equations, you have to differentiate. So let's start with the modular form. And, well, luckily I don't have to write it again because it's still here. We take this equation and we ask, okay, f is a modular form. Is f prime anything special? So let's simply differentiate this. So I apply d by d tau. So by the chain rule, when you differentiate f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d, you get f prime of a tau plus b over c tau plus d. But you have to multiply it by a factor, which is, of course, the tau derivative of this thing. And it's a one-line exercise that the answer is just 1 over c tau plus d squared. It's 1 because, remember, the determinant is 1. Otherwise, you would have the determinant in the numerator, but here it's 1. So that's the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you know, it's really easy. If you just, if you forget to differentiate the first term and apply the product rule, the derivative of the product, well, you get c tau plus d to the kf prime of tau. And if that were true, then I could put this c tau plus d to the squared to the right, and it would become c tau plus d to the k plus 2. And so I would have, if that were true, se fosse vero, avrei, f prime would be in mk plus 2. But since it isn't true, it's not. But I want to emphasize that it's not a modular form, but the, the weight of the modular form that it's not is exactly k plus 2, because you see this k plus 2. But unfortunately, there's a slight 
correction term, what the physicists would call an anomaly, which is that when you do differentiate the second term, of course, you get k times c times c tau plus d to the k minus 1, f of tau. And so f prime no longer is a multiple form because of this uh, bothersome term. Now, actually, f is something, and I'll talk about that. It's still on the list of talks. Uh, tomorrow, I'll talk about quasi multiple forms. So I'm not going to define them today yet, but they'll come up again tomorrow. So this is what's called a quasi multiple form. I mean, this is an example of what's called a quasi multiple form. That's a slightly wider class that allows even more applications and more liberty in applying the thing. But for the moment, you don't need a name. This is just a fact. And so what do you do with this? Well, what you do with it is very nice. You can, so there are several things. When mathematicians run into a difficulty, it never stops them. So if, if a theorem is false, you either change the definition so that you allow things to make it true. So that's what I just did. So multiple forms do not have the property that the derivative of a multiple form is a multiple form. It's false. So we just say, well, we'll have a wider class called quasi multiple forms. And now it's OK, because I just defined it that way. And it turns out, if you define it right, the derivative of all quasi multiple forms is still quasi multiple. You have a bigger ring. You'll see it in a minute in an example and tomorrow in more detail. Another thing you do is you say we eliminate the difficulty. So let's take another form, which is some, let's say, g, which has another weight, l. So we would have the same equation, g of uh, this, c tau plus d to the l, times g of tau. And now let me multiply this equation, the f prime equation, by the g equation. Then I'll have an f prime g term, and I'll have an f prime g term. Uh, that's correct. But then there'll be a correction term. All of that would be fine, because this has weight L. This has weight, if I just had that, weight K plus 2. When I multiply them, F prime times G would have weight K plus L plus 2, but it doesn't. But the error will be K times C times C tau plus D to the K minus 1 that I just had times F of tau. But I'm multiplying by the first equation. So there'll also be a G of tau. And there'll be another C tau plus D to the L. So the error will be this. So if, I, if you mentally multiply this f prime equation by the g equation, the extra term, this term that bothers you, has the form k times c times c tau plus d to the k plus l minus 1 times f times g. But this thing is completely symmetric if I interchange k and l, because f and g is symmetric and k plus l is symmetric. And so one of the equations will have an extra k times a certain correction term. One will have l times it. And therefore, if I make what's called the Rankin-Cohen bracket, I'm not going to explain why there are two names. The papers were 25 years apart. It wasn't a joint paper at all. Uh, I define the bracket, Rankin-Cohen bracket, of two forms to be f prime g. But then I also could have done it the other way. I could take f g prime. And then remember, the correction term here was k times something. Uh, sorry, f g prime. Here it was l times the same. Uh, let me do it the other way. It's more beautiful to keep things in alphabetical order. Then I can put the k here and the L here, and a minus sign. So now if I take this particular combination, K, which was the weight of F, times F times G prime, minus L, which was the weight of G, times F prime times G, then those correction terms will go away. And this thing now will be a modular form of weight K plus L plus 2. And that's very nice. You can check easily. It's an exercise that this thing is anti-symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity, so that M star, which was already ring now also becomes a Lie algebra, and it's even graded, but the grading is not k, but k plus 2. You have to shift it by 2 because of this shift. So suddenly, and they are com compatible with each other, it's actually so-called Poisson algebra. And actually, it has much more structure, so-called Rankin-Cohen algebra. So this is, you can do that. And actually, you can continue. There are higher ones. I'll only write the next one. So there's an FG2. This would have been FG1, but I didn't bother to. But the index, that would be k times k plus 1 times fg double prime minus 2 binomial coefficient, 2 times k plus 1 times l plus 1 times f prime g prime plus uh, l times l plus 1, f double prime g. And that would now be a multiple form, you can guess, of course, of weight k plus l plus 2. So we have these Rankin Cohen brackets. So that's one way you can get out of the difficulty. I just mentioned that because it's important, but I'll actually use it in the proof of theorem B later. So I, I'll try to remember not to erase it. Maybe if I circle it in green, that will remind me 
that it's meant to remain here for a few minutes. Okay, so that's another thing you can do. So as I say, if you have a difficulty, you either get out of it by changing the definition so the difficulty goes away, saying modular forms are part of a more general class, or you make combinations to eliminate the difficulty. Now, this combination is a true modular form in the original sense, but it's not just the product of f and g prime. It's a more complicated bilinear form, or higher bilinear forms. Okay, so those are things you can do. So now let me... Uh, give you some examples, and that will immediately lead to a proof of theorem one, the theorem A. But anyway, the examples are very pretty. Sorry? Oh, I thought I said it. I certainly, it's Kate. I was sure I wrote it. I'm sure I said it. Anyway, nobody can prove it now, although I'm on video, maybe you can prove it. K plus L plus 4, thank you very much. And the third one would be K plus L plus 6. I even said you can all guess, and what you would have guessed would have been right, but I wrote the wrong thing. Thank you. Okay, so let me give some examples. So remember the examples I gave yesterday, the basic examples of modular forms. I'll write them out in some detail. Well, this one was 240 times the sum and then the nth coefficient was the sum n cubed, m divides n, what I call sigma 3 of n, q to the n, which you can write a little more efficiently, this part, is simply the sum m from 1 to infinity. And then you can do the other sum, the multiples of m, is just a geometric series. So you can write it a little more efficiently as a simple sum rather than a double sum. And similarly, E6 of tau uh, was a similar thing. m to the fifth, q to the m over 1 minus q to the m. And finally, I had another one, delta of tau, which was something very strange looking, which was the product, 1 minus q to the n to the 24th. And then that product, not at all, obviously, this is a modular form of weight 4, this is a modular form of weight 6, and this is even much less, obviously, a modular form of weight 12. But those are all very classical theorems, the last one being due to dedicant. Okay, so we had that, and we had a relation between them, which is that 1728, which I remind you is 12 cubed, it'll cut play a role later, times delta of tau is e4 of tau cubed minus e6 of tau squared. At least we're in the right ballpark. This is weight 12, that is weight 12, that is weight 12. So at least they have a chance to be linear, linearly related. So now, let me, uh, if I were tall enough, maybe I can do it if I stand on tiptoe, Actually, you know, it's obvious how to define E2 of tau. You just take the same definition. Instead of 5 and 3, I'm just going to put 1. And so it'll be simply m. So this should be an m. m times q to the m over 1 minus q to the m. Or if you prefer, the sum sigma 1 of n q to the m, the sum of the devices to the first power. And then there should be a constant. And if you know the rule of formation of these, uh, it works perfectly well in weight 2. So E2 is a perfectly well defined form, but it's not a modular form. That's why yesterday I didn't give it on the list of modular forms, but it exists. And it is the same as the function I called G2, but G2, which I won't repeat today, was defined by non-absolutely convergent series. And if you sum in the obvious order, you get this. But if you change the order, you mess it up, and that's why it's not modular. OK, so we have this E2. But now we can do a very, very simple thing, pretty much in our, in our head. Well, it depends on the quality of our heads, of course, so maybe I'll do it on the board. I can't do it in my head. But let me change this n to m to make the calculation easier. Let me look at the logarithmic derivative of delta. So that would be the derivative of log delta, right? I mean, delta f prime over f for any function is the derivative of log. And log delta, well, it starts with log q, because here's delta. So that will be q, but the, but the q prime over q uh, is 1 because, sorry, not quite 1. q prime is e to the 2 pi i tau prime, which is 2 pi i times q. So actually, very soon, I'm going to abuse notation, and prime will change its meaning and mean I'd simply divide by 2 pi to get rid of this. But for the moment, maybe I'd better not. So the derivative normalized by 2 pi of delta prime I starts with the derivative q prime over q, but q prime up to this 2 pi i is q, so it starts with 1. Now, 
the log of, of something to the 24th is 24th times the something. So I get 24. And now I, a, a product turns into a sum. And now the derivative of the log of 1 minus q to the m is minus m times q to the m over 1 minus q to the m. And I hope that's familiar to you because that's the function I wrote down 10 seconds ago. That's e2. So in other words, this e2 was not quite modular, but for the same reason, in fact, it's very much an example. Unfortunately, I just erased it, but I had the equation for how f prime for a modular form transforms. And the way f prime transforms, maybe you remember there was an extra term, c tau plus d to the k minus 1, but there was a c tau plus d squared. So actually, there's an extra term with c tau plus d to the k plus 1. That was how, I'm sorry, I, I'd erased it. So if you divide by f of gamma tau, which is the same just to, with that, if you divide, then you see that f prime over f, in this case, we will find that delta prime over delta, which we now know is e2, satisfies e2 of gamma tau, is c tau plus d squared. But then you have a factor, minus or plus, uh, minus, I think, 6i over c tau plus d, uh, plus, if I put it like that, time, sorry, 6i, I'm not dividing, so c times c tau plus d. And, uh, First of all, you have the formula that you would have if it were modular, c tau plus d to the k e tau of 2. And now the correction term, so I'm trying to calculate and think at the same time, it would be 1 over 2 pi i with a minus sign, but I'm multiplying by minus 24, sorry, 1 over 2 pi times minus 24 is not quite 12. Uh, anyway, believe me, it's correct with the 6, uh, c times c tau plus d. So this is what you get if you simply apply the equation that I just, well, I, I, I raised it and then I wrote it here very illegibly. The equation that we had for f prime, you apply it to delta, divide by the original equation for delta, and you'll get this transformation law. Just as an example, let's take this just so you see it in all of its glory. I'll put it here, which some of you maybe can't read. The special case of the matrix 0 minus 1, 1, 0 would be tau squared e2 of tau plus 6i tau over pi, which means that the sign is wrong after all. Nobody can remember signs. And so here, if I specialize to e2 of i, I find that e2 of i is minus e2 of i, so I can put it 2, and then you get 6 over pi, and so e2 of i is 3 over pi, and indeed, if you substitute i into the series, it's exponentially convergent. It converges to 3 over pi. Okay, so we have this somewhat modified thing, and this is typical of what tomorrow will be uh, you know, repeated and, and use these so-called quasi-modular forms. So now we have something very pretty. So remember the calculation that I did a few minutes ago. If f is an ordinary modular form, then f of gamma tau is something times f of tau. But then, if I differentiate that, I got f prime of gamma tau with something else. This something was c tau plus d to the k. This was c tau plus d to the k plus 2. I'm not going to write it all out down. And there was a correction term that involved only f. And if I differentiate again and again, of course, I'll keep having more terms. So if you do this, and now so that we don't go crazy, Please allow me to change my notation. f prime of tau, I'm going to change the definition, is still the derivative, but it's the derivative with respect to 2 pi i tau. So it's 1 over 2 pi i times the usual derivative, and if you like q, it's, uh, it's q times the q derivative. So that's very convenient because it means if f is the sum a n q to the n, then f prime is simply the sum n a n q to the n. If I didn't divide by 2 pi i, all of the forms would fill up with transcendental factors 2 pi i, and it completely mess. I want to be doing arithmetic. So let me just redefine the, the meaning of prime. So all forms on the right just became wrong. This is correct because I, I was very careful not to say what I was saying. So now let's do a little calculation. So I have theorem, I won't call it theorem C because it, somehow it's completely independent. Theorem, it's not really a theorem, it's an easy, easy observation, but it was a wonderful discovery of Ramanujan, many, obviously many years ago, since he died in 1920. 
theorem is that if you take the derivatives of E2, E4, or E6, then even though they're no longer multiple forms, they are still polynomials in E2, E4, and E6. Actually, they're quasi-multiple forms, this word that I mentioned, and in this case, we know that all quasi-multiple forms are polynomials in E2, E4, and E6. And the formulas are very simple. So these are Ramanujan's famous formulas. The weight always has to go up by two. So here the weight was six, it has to become eight. Two plus six is eight, two times four is eight. Similarly here, two plus, this has to have weighed six, so it could be E2, E4, or it could be E6. And you notice that in the formula that I just wrote and erased, sum a n q to the n prime is the sum n a n q to the n. You've always killed the constant term. Q to the zero goes away. So there can't be a constant since every e starts with one. This starts with one, then I have to take, this multiple has to be one to make it have no constant term. So only the thing in front is a little mysterious. And the values are half, a third, and a twelfth. And everything else is the only thing it could be. So those are the theorems. Now let me give you the proof. E4 is a multiple form. So you write down the equation for E4 and for E4 prime, as I did it on this board. But you also write down the equation for E2 that I also had on the board, and in fact uh, still do, somewhere for E2. It's over there. And if you do that, what you'll find is that E4 prime fails to be a multiple form. And so does E2 times E4, but a linear combination of them, namely exactly this combination, is a multiple form of weight 6. And since this starts with 0 as a constant term, this starts with minus a third, it therefore has to be minus a third E6. And the same for the other two. So it's completely trivial using, again, the magic of multiple forms. If you suspect an identity, there are clever proofs of this, of course. But you don't need a clever proof. The modularity properties automatically tell you that it's true. So I just put etc. for the other two cases. So each one is a one-line proof. So we have this lovely fact, and that means that uh, the ring of quasi multiple forms, which is usually called M star tilde, is in fact, well, it doesn't mean, but it's true, that that ring here is generated by E4, E2, and E6, and it's closed under differentiation. I'll just put closed under prime. Okay. Now let me prove theorem A. Uh, let me make a lot of space for the proof. It's not going to be very hard. So, proof of theorem A. If F, oh, that's too easy to prove a theorem, an important theorem in such a huge space. Let me strengthen, strengthen the theorem, I already strengthened by adding autonomous. Every multiple form or quasi multiple form satisfies a nonlinear differential equation. It doesn't in fact be multiple. We'll see an example for E2 in a minute. So, the answer is if let F be a quasi multiple form, well, I just showed. But that since every quasi, or I told you, every quasi multiple form is a polynomial in E2, E4, and E6. But their derivatives are still in the ring, and they generate the ring. So the whole ring, as I already wrote, is closed under differentiation. So if F is in there, well, then it's still in there after I write it the second time, but so is its derivative, so is its second derivative, and so is its third derivative, whether or, whether or not I put in the 2 pi i. So if you have a multiple form, or for that matter, a quasi multiple form, it makes no difference here, then it and its first three derivatives are all quasi multiple forms. But this thing, as I told you, in fact, that's how I just proved this, is generated by only three objects. So therefore, an algebra generated by three things has transcendence to get most three, here exactly three. So any four objects are linearly dependent, algebraically dependent, in other words, there exists a polynomial, such that P of F, F prime, F double prime, F triple prime vanishes identically. It's simply a fact about an algebra with three generators that any four generators are polynomially dependent. It's kind of a trivial algebraic fact. So this theorem is not at all deep. It's sort of obvious, and you see why we need it exactly third order, because I needed four derivatives, because four is bigger than three, and I have three generators, E2, E4, and E6. And in fact, it doesn't work with fewer. So now I want to concentrate on the interesting theorem, which is theorem B. So theorem B also I'll have to sharpen in several ways. First of all, I should now admit that I lied. Well, as it's written, it's correct, because I didn't say what I meant by linear differential equation. Later, I did tell you what I meant. I said a linear differential equation to me means with polynomial coefficients. 
And then this thing should be what's called a Haupt module. I suggest I just don't worry about it. Some of you know, some of you don't. If anybody wants to ask later, certain modular functions are and certain aren't, and all the ones I'll show you are. So if you take a random modular function, so for instance, j that we had yesterday, yesterday we had one interesting example of a modular function as opposed to modular form. That was the famous j function defined as e4 cubed divided by delta. So it started q inverse plus 744 plus 196,884 q and so on. Very famous function. This is a Haupt module. Haupt module is, of course, German, as you might guess. It means principal modular function. So it generates the, the ring of all, the field of all functions. And j squared isn't. But it is still a modular function. So, so as I just said, if you look at all modular functions for a given group, they form a field. And if that field is simply generated by one particular element like j, then that's called a Haupt module. And in all the cases we'll look at, that's the case. Otherwise, there's, the theorem is not false, but the linear differential equation will have algebraic coefficients rather than polynomials. It's a small detail. I just didn't want to actually lie. But let's leave it for now. OK, so let's look first what this theorem says and why it's not nonsense. Because as I've written it, the theorem is nonsense. And somebody should have complained, in particular the students who are supposed to still be you know, paying attention to what they hear. When they hear something wrong, they should complain. Because what do I mean when I say that f satisfies a linear differential equation with respect to t? Well, I can only mean one thing, and I do, but it's slightly wrong unless you interpret it correctly, which is what I'm coming to. It means that you change the you change, make a substitution, you change the name of the independent variable from tau to t. So what was originally small f of tau, which was a modular form of some weight k, now becomes a function capital F, not of tau, but of t of tau. But this is, so for some, for some f of t, which might be, you know, a function of power series. And then the claim was that there's a linear differential operator, L, which annihilates f, and L is some kind of a combination of p n of t, some polynomial times d to the n over dt to the n, where n goes from 0 to the order, which was supposed to be k plus 1. So that was the claim. But there's a big problem with this theorem. Namely, I can't write this. Because if I replace tau by gamma tau, which is some a tau plus b over c tau plus d for my group, then f of tau, as we very much know by now, does not remain invariant. It changes by this famous factor. But t is a modular function. So t of tau just goes to itself. So now we have a function, capital F, which at the same value t of tau takes on two different values. And I remind you, professional mathematicians forget this amazingly often. A function is something that assigns to every number one value. That's what we mean by a function. There are no many valued functions. It's an abuse of terminology. Of course, they exist, but they shouldn't be called that. OK, so in other words, this f cannot exist. You cannot have that for all tau in the upper half plane that you have this simply because there are different tau's with the same t but different values of f. So that's certainly impossible. But you can have this locally. And by the way, if I did things locally, to come back to your question, then of course I could take all the roots I want, and we in fact sometimes do that. So if you take a point in the upper half plane and you take a small neighborhood, now that small neighborhood you will not find, if it's not a fixed point, you will not find two points that are equivalent under the group. And so you won't run into this problem. Nothing will stop you locally from inverting t of tau and writing your function, which was a function of tau, as a function of t. And then that function will satisfy differential equation. But then by analytic continuation, it still will if you move around. The polynomials can't change. So as you move to different neighborhoods, you'll always have the same operator. Indeed, this operator will work everywhere. So the operator is well defined, but f isn't. But that's just what you want. When you do linear differential equations, you have monodromy. If you have an nth order differential equation, you have n solutions. If you pick a basis n at a point, and then you move around in a closed loop, which goes around the singularity of the equation, then you get also a basis of n solutions. But it's not the same n. There's some n by n matrix. And if you keep doing that for all the loops, you get a group of matrices called the monodromy group. Well, that's perfect, because that's what we want. We have a many-valued function, so it's just set up to be and in fact, I'll reveal now the secret, the formal proof. There's, I, I, in my book, the one, two, three, that you have all already bought, uh, there are three different proofs given of theorem B, 
The three together take up one page. It's not that hard, but it's such an important theorem, I wanted to give different points of view. So there are three proofs, and one of them tells you what all the solutions are. So the theorem says, as I just wrote, that there exists an operator of order k plus 1, which kills f. So therefore, the kernel of L and the things annihilated, the solution space of this differential operator, will contain f. But we know that the solution space of an nth order differential operator has to be n-dimensional. So here we need k plus 1 functions. And what are they? Well, it's not hard to guess at all. It's simply tau, f of tau, f, tau f of tau, up to tau to the k f of tau. And that's exactly why there are k plus 1 of them, because you go. And now you see this space is wonderful. If I call this space, I mean, I'm not going to do the proof along these lines, but I wanted to mention this. If I just call this space v, of course, it depends on tau. I mean, it's not a good notation. Locally, it's a collection of functions. But I don't mean this collection. I mean the space spanned by. That was a basis, and you take all linear combinations. So in other words, it's equal to f of tau times polynomials in tau of degree at most k as a vector space. So it has k, dimension k plus 1. But now you see that that space is very nice, because if you think that f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is equal to c tau plus d to the k times f of tau, then if I call f i is tau to the i times f, where i goes from 0 to k, then you see that f i will be f i of tau multiplied by, oh my gosh, can I do this? Yes by a tau plus b over c tau plus d to the i. But then, of course, this c tau plus d, I can change k to k minus i and just kill it. And now you see that c tau plus d to the k minus i times a tau plus b to the i is a polynomial of degree k. So it's still in the space. So in other words, if phi is any function in this space, then phi of gamma tau is also in the space. There's no automorphic factor anymore. It took care of itself. What was previously the c tau plus d to the k is now taken care of by this collection. And that's the basis of the actual natural proof of this theorem. But I thought I would give you also a calculational proof, at least in the case when k is 1, how you actually write down the differential equation. And then I'll turn finally to examples. Well, just to relieve the boredom, if there is boredom or to make it less abstract, I forgot to give the example of theorem 1. So I backtrack slightly to make an example of theorem 1, of theorem A, excuse me. That was the nonlinear. I take, remember that the theorem wasn't just true for modular forms, but quasi-modular forms. So it's easiest to take E2. It's the smallest. And it's the only one where the equation isn't, I mean, it gets more and more complicated. So if F is E2, and now I think, no, I take my new prime, then you just check using, so I gave you the formula how to div differentiate E2. But then you have E4, then if you differentiate again, you'll need E6. But then you can differentiate as many times as you want. You'll never need more than E2, E4, and E6. So if you take F2 and differentiate three times, you'll get some polynomial, very easy to compute in those three variables. If you take F and F double prime, you'll also get a polynomial. And if you take F prime squared, and multiply by three halves, you'll also get a polynomial. And when you check, you'll find that this equation is simply true using those. So this is an immediate consequence of Ramanujan's formulas. And this is actually a famous equation connected with, Pandave, with the Pandave story. And it's called Chazy's equation. Uh, Chazy's equation. And so it's studied in, I don't want to go into that at all, and I don't know much about it. But anyway, so that was an example of the nonlinear thing which I didn't want to talk about now, but I just remembered that I hadn't given you an example. So now let's go back, and I want to prove this theorem now in an explicit way, and then I want to give you the examples. Yeah. It's a wonderful question. The answer is, in general, no. But there are two necessary, so let me say louder because you didn't have a microphone. The question is, can you invert? If somebody gives me a differential equation, linear, with some monodromic group, can I somehow, can I say that it's multilinear? The answer is certainly not. It almost never is. I'll give examples in a second. This is a super rare phenomenon among the multiple equations. But the monodromic group must satisfy two properties, which I'll come to a little later, one of which is easier to check algebraically, one isn't. 
But if the equation came as a so-called Picard-Fuchs equation, which I mentioned before, for instance, of affirmative color BLs, then the second property is automatic. And in that case, it's conjecturally always modular, but it's not proved. So the answer is it's usually not modular. When it is, we have criteria that we think are necessary and sufficient. They aren't necessarily easy to check, but sometimes you can check them, and we think we have the picture. But that's uh, it's a very, very good question. And uh, uh, I'll, but I'll come to that a little, I hope. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Worse than yesterday. So I thought today I had so, much, so little material I could go really slowly. I hope you noticed, but I'm going to run out of time. Nevertheless, I do want to give the proof of the theorem. I was going to give it at the end, but I'm going to give it now, right now. So let's prove that this theorem B explicitly, as I said, the true reason is what I told you, that the kernel is f of tau times all polynomials to degree at most k. Let me assume k is 1, just to simplify life a little. So luckily, I didn't erase my Rankine-Cohen things. So let f be a multiple form of weight 1. And t, remember, was a multiple function. I'm not going to write it all again, because it's still here. F is a multiple form now of weight 1. t is a multiple function, so does weight 0. Now, I look at t prime, the derivative. Well, 1 over 2 pi times the derivative. That's a detail. Then that will be a multiple form of weight 2. Because if you think of the calculation I did at the beginning, the derivative of a multiple form of weight k failed to be multiple of weight k plus 2. But the failure was k times something. So if k is 0, you're OK. There is no failure. So the derivative of a multiple function is a true multiple form, not quasi multiple So therefore, that means that I can make the expression f. And remember, I had the bracket. You don't have to remember, because I carefully didn't erase it. The bracket of two multiple forms, here's the definition, but who cares, uh, is something whose weight is the sum of the weight. So this is weight 1, this is weight 2, and then you have to add 2. So this is a form of weight 5. But I don't want to keep that. I want to divide by f and by t prime squared. Let's call this a of tau. Then this has weight 0. And similarly, I can take f and itself. Now if I took the Rankine bracket, I would get 0 because this is anti-symmetric. But I can take the second Rankine-Cohen bracket. That's why I wrote it ff2. And that will have weight 2 plus 2 plus not 2 but 4. So it is weight 8. No. F at weight 1. 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. It's much better because it's what I wanted. And I'll divide for some reason by 2 times f squared times t prime squared. And I even put a minus sign. And I call that b of tau. And now this will also be a multiple form of weight 0 simply because of the properties of the rankine cohen bracket that I told you. So this will be a very calculational proof. Quite short, it will give no insight. The insight is what I told you before, that the solutions of our f of tau, tau f of tau, up to tau to the k. This will be computational, but it has the advantage of giving you the answer, of giving you the differential equation explicitly. So we have these two functions. I hope this was clear up to now. t is weight 0, therefore its derivative has weight 2. f is weight 1 by assumption, and therefore these rankine cohen brackets have weight 6, uh, what was it, 5 and 6 respectively. The denominator also has weight 5 or 6 respectively. So these quotients, a of tau and b of tau, have weight 0. But remember that I told you that a Haupt module, which is what we actually need, has the property that any modular function of weight 0 is some rational function of t. So all modular functions uh, can be written as rational functions of t of tau. So a and b, a of t, and b of t, which are just functions of a single variable, are simply rational functions, quotients of polynomials. Very, very easy. OK? And now I simply write out this. I cannot do by, by heart. And I don't think any, anybody could be expected to remember the calculation by, by heart. If I now take the second derivative, but not in tau, but in t of f, and then I take a of t times the first derivative in t. But let me write it like this. This is going to be my differential operator. And I claim that this operator is going to kill my function. And then I'm done. I've given my second order differential equation. Because a and b, I said I needed polynomials. They're rational. But then I just multiply this by a common denominator. So I, I want to show that this is 0. So let's just do it. Well, when I differentiate in t, that's the same as differentiating in tau, but then dividing by the derivative of tau. Well, sorry, it should be prime. So if I have f 
if I differentiate in t, that's the same as differentiating in tau with the 2 pi i, and then dividing by t also with the 2 pi, so it doesn't matter. So that's the first derivative. And now to differentiate a second time, I do the same. I put another prime and t prime. Then I just continue. A, I copy from, from this formula. So if you look at the definition that is still not erased of the first rank and cone bracket, it doesn't matter at all. And if you're taking notes, don't bother. If you want to see this calculation, of course, it's written in the book. Uh, so here, well, if again, the derivative in t is 1 over t prime f prime, because it's not the tau derivative, which is f prime, but the t derivative. And A is this factor. That's the rank and cone bracket divided by f t prime squared. You don't have to follow every detail. Just I want you to see that it's a, a two-line calculation, that it's very elementary. Obviously, it takes a little time to check every step. So now, finally, I write b, which is this expression. I'm just copying it. The 2 goes into the definition of ff2. I hope I didn't make a mistake, f. And if you multiply this out, you just find that it's identically 0 for any function f, multiple or not. So, so that's the end of that, of that story. So you see that that proves completely explicitly, if you, if you give me an f, I can actually work out a and b as multiple forms and then write them as rational functions of t, and I will get my differential equation. Ooh, I'm going to make a one-minute pause and clean some boards, and then you'll have only examples, no more theory. Now I don't need any of this. It's all gone. So I'm going to give you three examples. Two are very classical and very simple, also very beautiful, and the third will be the upper re one. So example one. So gamma, remember, was SL2z in my notation. It is a subgroup which is index six. Ah, uh, it's PSL2z. Don't worry, it's up to sign the matrices. Forget it. Gamma of two is the matrices A, B, C, D, such that A and D are both odd and B and C are both even. Actually, it's enough to say B and C are even then and D have to be odd. So notice this is simply congruent to the identity matrix modulo 2. So if I'm really correct, I should put here PSL2Z, which means matrices up to sign, because A tau plus B over C tau plus D doesn't change if you change A, B, C, and D to the negative. So that's really the group. But I don't want to be that pedantic. Anyway, this is the subgroup. And here we have the help module J of tau. But here we have a help module called lambda of tau. So it's an explicit function. And uh, let me uh, write it out to give the example. So this is a very classical function. It's due to Legendre. This is the famous Legendre form of elliptic curves. I'm not sure if he gave the form as I now gave. So let me remind you that I already had, I wrote it before and took it away, theta 3 of tau is the sum. It was the q to the n squared we've already had, but I changed tau to tau over 2. So this thing is some modular form of weight a half since I haven't really defined it, just forgive me. But if I squared, which I will in a second, it would have weight one, which I have defined. This is on gamma of two. And similarly, there's, there are three of these Jacobi theta series called two, three, and four. One, for some reason, isn't there. There's a very good reason. So if you simply write the same thing, q to the n squared over two, but instead of shifting over zero, summing over zero plus or minus one plus or minus two, you sum over plus or minus a half, plus or minus three halves, etc. That's called theta two, and this is also a modern form in the same group. And actually, there's a very important function that the students who came afterwards yesterday saw because in answer to a question, I wrote it out. I meant to give it yesterday. It's the dedicant eta function. And it's defined exactly like uh, the delta, but without the 24, or rather there is therefore 24 here. So it's simply the 24th root of delta, but it was, delta was found by Ramanujan in 1916. This was found by Dedekind in 1868, so it's much older, and it's actually a much simpler function. This, of course, is weight a half, actually on gamma, where you have to interpret this the right way. So on the full group, and that's because this had weight 12, and 12 divided by 24 is a half. So this is weight a half, and then each of these functions have a very nice representation uh, in terms of the eta function. Not that it matters, but just to, to make it really explicit. So the other one is 2 times 8 of 2 tau squared 
over. I probably made a mistake, but this is what I wrote in my notes. Maybe it's correct. OK, so now the claim is I'm going to apply the theorem. My t is going to be lambda. And my f is going to be not theta 3, because remember in the theorem, the weight had to be an integer. So the weight, k, had to be an integer. I said that positive integer weight. So I take the square of theta 3. That will have weight 1. And so the claim is that theta 3, this is an identity due, I think, to Jacobi, at a guess, but I have no idea. I didn't check it. If you square theta 3 of tau and expand it as a power series locally in lambda of tau, then the coefficients are very simple. You take the middle binomial coefficient, 2n over n, so 2n factorial over n factorial squared, divide by 16 to the n, and that's the coefficient. That's the expansion. So it's much, much simpler than the Q expansion, because the Q expansion of a multiple form, like delta, has some unknown difficult arithmetic function, like the ramanujan tau function, or some of the divisors that depends on you know, various things. This is just a, a simple thing. And in fact, if I call this now, as I was doing before, f of lambda of tau, so that f of t is the function, I'll just write it again, but without the lambda, 1 over 16 to the n times 2n over n. Uh, sorry, this would be trivial. 2n over n, that would be Newton's theorem, that would be the square root. It's 2n over n squared, excuse me. Somebody should have stopped me. That would be a trivial theorem, just binomial theorem, to binomial expansion. If I take this function, this has a name. This is the, it's the wrong name, as often in mathematics, it's called the Gauss hypergeometric function, because order wrote huge papers about 100 years or 80 years earlier, and Gauss studied them and quoted Euler profusely, but for some reason they got named after him. Anyway, this is the, does every, has everyone seen the hypergeometric function, or should I write it down? It's terribly unimportant for what I'm doing. It's just, all you have to know is that it's a standard function that satisfies a second order linear differential equation, which I certainly won't write down, but I'll just give it. The first coefficient is AB over C. The next one is A times A plus 1 times b times b plus 1 over c times c plus 1 times 2 factorial, and so on. So this is called the Gauss, but it should be the order, hypergeometric function, and it satisfies the famous second order linear differential equation. So in this case, theta 3 of tau squared is this hypergeometric equation, a uh, hypergeometric function, which does satisfy an equa uh, differential equation, as promised, in lambda. So that's the first example, completely classical example, very, very well known and with many applications. I don't need this anymore. Uh, the second one is a little more complicated. We take the first multiple form on the full group. So the, the first multiple form on the full group, as we saw yesterday, has weight 4, and it's E4 up to a constant. It's unique up to a constant. E4 of tau. And this time, so that will be my f, and my t will be the j function, but I prefer 1 over j of tau. So if you remember j, which I think I just erased, but j started q, in, q inverse plus 744 and so on. So if I take its reciprocal, this starts q minus 744 q squared and so on. It is integer coefficients, but it starts with q. So you can also write q as t plus 744 t squared, and the further coefficients are completely different. You can write, it's an invertible expression. You can write locally, q is a power series in t, or t is a power series in q. And this e4, remember, started 240q plus 2060q squared, and so on. So I can certainly write this, then, also in terms of uh, q. So e is also, I don't have them written down, but it would be 240t plus dot, 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 where t, remember, is 1 over j. So I can write my e4 as some function of t, which is 1 over j. And now, that should satisfy a fifth order differential equation. So if you're a reasonable person, even if you're an expert in mathematics, you'll say, this is not going to be familiar. I knew the Gauss hypergeometric. I know Bessel functions. They have second order. Nobody carries around fifth order equations in their head. Nobody actually knows by heart the solution of a fifth order equation. But of course, that's not true. Everybody does. Namely, uh, this function is the same Gauss Euler hypergeometric function that I just had, the parameters now, instead of being a half, a half, and one, there are 12, 5 twelfths, and one. But it's simply the fourth power of that. So if you know a function, you also know its fourth power. 
And it's an easy fact that if a function satisfies a first order linear equation, a second order linear equation, then its kth power satisfies a k plus first order linear equation. And so this is the example. And so it is a familiar function, even though you might think that you don't know by heart any functions satisfying fifth order in your differential equations. But in fact, f to the fourth is such a one. So those were the easy example. By the way, the first one I said I don't know. I think it's Jacobi. This one I do know. This is the famous identity Frick and Klein. And maybe Klein and Fricke. They wrote several papers and books, and, and the order kept changing. So uh, who, was, who was the senior author? OK, so now I want to finally, oh, 10 minutes. Then I'm going to have to just tell you the, the facts without, I was going to give you some of the proofs, a little bit of the proof. I want to tell you the apiary application, because I would think that's what you came for, except since the titles had got lost on the internet, maybe you didn't know. But anyway, I promised to show you this proof uh, using modularity that say the three is not in Q. So let me first write what Apiary did. And it's an absolutely beautiful theorem, which now has several proofs. He gave one modulo that some things were a bit mysterious. Berkus gave it actually two more, and I think by now there are others. So to find two sequences, a n for a priori and b n for, I don't know, is not for a priori. Uh, well, before I give them, I'll give you a little table so that you get a feeling for how they look. And if you're taking notes, leave a little bit of space, as I'll also do. So the first one, the a n, which are called the a priori numbers, although he found both sequences, well, I know them by heart. They start. 1, 5, 73, 14, 45, and the next one is 33,001. But then you define a second sequence. I'll write it down in a second. And maybe some people can't see if I write any lower because of that thing. So let me move, translate to the left. So I define them by recursion, and the recursion is very beautiful, or very ugly, depending on your taste in such things. If you already know a n and a n minus 1, then a n plus 1 is 1 over n plus 1 cubed times a somewhat complicated looking cubic polynomial, which is 34 n cubed plus 51 n squared plus 27 n plus 5 times a n minus n cubed times a n minus 1. And then b n is defined by exactly the same recursion. So because this is a three-term recursion, if I tell you two initial values, then you get all the further values. So if I start with 1 and 5, then I get these. But if I start with 0 and 1, I get some other numbers, of which the first two, I think, Or this, but it might be 62,931. And the next one I definitely don't remember, and I need it. Uh, let me drop the next one anyway for the moment. Uh, here. No. Damn, that's yesterday's notes. It's even worse. I had a little table. Uh, it's disappeared. Well, I have it in many of the papers here. Here. 62, I'm getting old, my memory is all wrong, 62, 531, over 216. The next one I'll write in a minute. So if you look at these numbers, so I, I, I now finish the sentence. Define A and B, and that's just a little table, by this recursion with the initial values, as, I, as you see in the table, 1, 5, and 0, 1, and then the others take care of themselves. OK? Then there are three statements. So if you look at this, let's say that a n and a n minus 1 were integers, as you see here for the first few. Well, then this right-hand side is an integer, but I have to divide by n plus 1 cubed. So a priori, a priori, a n would be an integer, but only with an integer divided by n factorial cubed. Similarly, b n for the same reason. But in fact, if you look at the table, you see that the first five a n's are all integers, and the first statement uh, which he proved by giving an explicit formula. And the explicit formula was certainly an integer, but it was far from obvious that it satisfied the recursion, and his proof was somehow didn't use non-standard uh, 
things like a divergent series and infinite expressions, and nobody could quite make sense out of it, but I mean, everyone knew it was right because it, it checked, and he certainly had found it and had proved it. Uh, so there's a mysterious, so his proof is very ad hoc. You write down an explicit formula, which is obviously an integer. That part's easy, well, guessing it is not easy, but then you have to prove the recursion, and for that you need some kind of cleverness. Now, the second statement is that Bn, well, it's not an integer, as you can see in the table, and so far it looks as bad as it could be, because 2 factorial is 2, 2 cubed is 8, 3 factorial is 6, 6 cubed is 2, 16. So it looks like we've gained nothing. But in fact, if you take the next number in the sequence, it's really big, 1, 1, 4, 2, 4, 6, 9, 5, but the denominator is only 17, 28, which I pointed out to you before and told you to remember is 12 cubed. But 4 factorial is not 12, it's 24. So we've gained something. And so the second statement is that bn is not an integer, that's true, but it has denominator at most n, n, which is not the product of the numbers from 1 up to n, but their least common multiple, which is much, much smaller. The n factorial grows more than exponentially, but the least common multiple grows like e to the n. That's a well-known fact. So therefore, this denominator only grows like e cubed to the n, so approximately like 21 to the n. So roughly, the denominator of bn is something, well, it's less than 21 to the n, but an and bn themselves grow that's very easy to see, like roughly 34 to the n because of the nature, because of that 34. So therefore, that means that a n divided by b, uh, rather b n divided by a n tends to its limit very quickly because both satisfy the same recursion. So that part's very easy that it's quick, but it's not obvious what the limit is. And the third part of Apiri's theorem is that this limit is one sixth zeta of three. So now together, this has a corollary, and I, I was going to do it, it takes three or four minutes, uh, maybe afterwards if there's a question or in the time of the students, I can go through if somebody wants to see. But an easy and completely standard number theoretical argument tells you immediately, if you have any numbers with these properties, now you can forget the definition, just these properties, and call the limit whatever you want, that limit is irrational, automatically. And the reason is, very roughly, any solution of the, of the equation has to grow like either roughly 34 to the n or roughly 34 to the minus n because of the nature of the recursion. So therefore, because the limit bn over an is a 6 to 8 of 3, if I take this difference, it's much smaller than 34 to the n. Therefore, it has to be roughly 34 to the minus n. And that means that this rapidity, the difference between this and this, is 1 over 34 squared, which is about 1,100 to the n whereas the denominator is only 34 to the n times 21 to the n, which is less than 700. And so this is converging. A sequence of rational numbers converge to its limit, and the difference is much smaller than the denominator. The difference goes like 1 over 1,100 to the n, and the denominator is less than 1 over 700 to the n, and that's enough to prove irrationality. It's an almost trivial argument. So the big puzzle was how do you prove these three things? I won't say anything about those two. It's slightly more technical, but just a brief word about this. So as I said, the way that Apiary did it is he wrote down an explicit formula, which is obviously an integer, but it's very not obvious that it satisfies the recursion. Just for fun, I'll tell you what it was, but it doesn't help at all to see why the recursion is true. You take the binomial coefficients n over k, k going from 0 to n, square them, multiply by the square but this binomial coefficient, that's a n. You can check the first few values of what I told you. That's obviously an integer, but the recursion is not obvious. So the question is, why? So he, as I said, gave this calculational proof, rather ad hoc. He explained where it came from. There were, of course, ideas that led him to it. But then Berkers found that there's something very beautiful. Let me define f of t to be the sum a n t to the n. So this is the power series whose coefficients are these numbers. 1, 5, 73, 14, 45, and so on. Then the recursion. 
give it a name. I mean, I won't use it because I'm not going to give you the details of the calculation. Here, the recursion, everybody knows who's ever written down linear differential equations already in, in, in university. You, you learn that as exercises. It's completely easy to translate a recursion with, with polynomial coefficients into a differential equation for the generating function with polynomial coefficients and vice versa. So it tells you that L, L here is an explicit uh, third order Differential operator, I won't write it down. Differential operator, completely explicit. You just write it down. And that's just a translation of the recursion. So, so far, we've done nothing. This is standard. So what we have to do is show that that that's equation, and the nature of the equation is such it has a unique holomorphic solution at the origin, a unique power series. And so that power series is just the AN satisfying this recursion. But then, as I said, a priori, they would have a huge denominator from the differential equation. So the question is why, if f is equal to 1 plus so, and if it's a power series with, well, it's automatically rational from the recursion, but the complex coefficient starting with 1, and this L f equals 0, why does that imply that f has integer coefficients? That was the whole mystery. And now to come back to the question of how frequent this is, Apiri gave two similar proofs for zeta of 3 and zeta of 2. Z of 2 was not exciting because it had been, it was known by order to be pi squared over 6. But he gave exactly similar proofs. For Z of 2, it was a second order equation. That equation belongs to a very natural three parameter family. And so I once did an experiment. I took 100 million values, integer values of those three parameters. And only six times did this integrality miracle happen. Apiris and five more. And those were the six multiple ones. And I could show they were the only multiple ones. So it happened, but only six times out of 100 million. So that's a very rare phenomenon, just to come back. But anyway, we're now in this check. So the question is, why is it, uh, why is it true? And so now I tell you Berger's observation. I mean, it, it proves itself. Well, it's standard calculations once you've discovered it. But it's an amazing discovery. It was really one of the most beautiful pieces of number theory uh, found. So with Berger's, Fritz Berger's, who was my colleague for many years in Utrecht, Berger's discovery, the S is correct, of course, Berger's discoveries, take the function, so I'm going to take f of tau, remember the eta function, if you don't, you remember at least that there was such a function, it had weighed a half, so if I take its seventh power with two tau and its seventh power with three tau, that is weighed seven, seven halves plus seven halves, and I divide by eta tau to the sixth and eta of six tau, sorry, to the fifth. So this is weighed five halves and five halves, the total weight is seven fives and five halves. This is weight two on a group that happens to be called gamma zero of six, which means A, B, C, D, such that six divides C. That group is called gamma zero of six, but it doesn't matter. So that's a multiple form of weight two. And T of tau is exactly, well, T of tau I know by heart. You do the same, but the numerator goes upstairs, is the denominator, the denominator is the numerator, and now all powers are six instead of five and seven. So since 6 plus 6 equals 6 plus 6, that has weight 0. So indeed, I'm in the situation of theorem B, no longer weight 1, now it's weight 2. So this must satisfy a third order equation. So if you compute the beginning of the expansion, well, it's very easy because remember, eta, well, maybe you don't remember, but I'll tell you again, it was eta, probably 1 minus q to the n, which it has very simple expansion as Euler found, all coefficients are plus or minus 1 or 0. So it's very easy to take 8 of tau, 8 of 2 tau, you put 1 minus q squared and so on. You multiply it out, and you get the beginning of both expansions. It's no problem at all. Now the coefficients are very small, because this is a holomorphic multiple form. They have just polynomial growth. So they're 1, 5, 13, 23. The next one is 29, and so on. OK? And similarly, t, its coefficients grow a little faster, but it's got completely explicit coefficients. It's q minus 12q squared plus 66q cubed minus 220q to the fourth, and so on. Those are just standard q expansions. You just stick in the expansion of eta. But now, as I said before, since t is a power series in q with integer coefficients and leading coefficients q, of course, I can invert this. q will therefore be t plus 12t squared plus something or other. And then I can substitute that into this. And so this will become a new power series in t. And guess what? Well, I'm sure you've already guessed. 
What you see if you look at the first 10 coefficients are the up here numbers. So the up here numbers are exactly the coefficients that the expansion of a multiple form of weight 2 in terms of multiple function of multiple form of weight 0. But then by theorem B, we know that automatically any multiple form of weight 2 in terms of any multiple function of weight 0 is the solution of a differential equation of order 2 plus 1, 3. So therefore, you know that this satisfies the differential equation. And it's explicit. I showed you how to find it. You do it, and you find exactly the same equation as up here recursion. And so they both have the same recursion. The first 100 or 10,000 terms on the computer are the same, but you only need two. The first two coefficients are the same, same recursion, so they're the same. And therefore, everything's an integer, because here I never left the world of integers. I never divided by n cubed. That gave a completely natural proof using multiple forms, very, very unexpected application, and that's the one I wanted to end with today. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, questions, uh, Giuseppe? We can wait for it. Uh, BN was crucial for the proof, which unfortunately I now erased. Uh, let me write it. I'll, I'll answer, but I, I want to show you, but I erased it. I have to write it again. Apiri's theorem had three parts. Well, I'm, I'm answering. No, no. I I, I'm yeah. saying it's clear that if you date the ratio, these things will come okay. out right. No, in the modular uh, story. Oh, sorry. You don't mean the rule. In the proof, you mean yeah. how do I get BN? Yeah. That's, unfortunately, another very good question, which I have to be a little evasive. I'll tell you, but using words that you haven't quite seen. So it's... Uh, so the question indeed is the absolutely right question. Uh, to make Apiri's proof work, remember I needed three statements. One was that an is an integer. An was the first solution, and I just showed you why that's true. Second, I needed that bn was a near integer. Its denominator was much smaller than it could have been, not the cube of n factorial, but of this GCD, which grows only like 2.7 to the n. And finally, I needed that the ratio, which is, it's easy to see that it tends very rapidly to something, and you can check it numerically, but that it's a zeta of three. So the question is, what is the, so the modular meaning of A I gave you, if I take this T and F, which I just erased, but you can still see part of it, so it doesn't matter, but F and T were some explicit products of eta functions, then what I told you was that, so T of tau was a modular function, actually it's a Hope module, not quite on gamma 0 of 6, but on a slightly bigger group that contains the index 2 called gamma 0 star. Forget that. But the statement was that if I took the sum a and t of tau to the n, then this was the function I called f of tau, which was a multiple form, in this case, of weight 2, on the same group which happens to be gamma 0 of 6. That's a detail. Important is that it's weight 2. And so the question was, what is the modular nature of the other function? And so I can tell you, it turns out it's the product of two functions, one of which is called, it's, the, it's not called f, it is the same f, and the other are called g tilde. And so g of tau is, again, a modular form on gamma 0 of 6, and it's an Eisenstein series. And, well, I mean, just for completeness, I can even say what it is, because it takes a line, and then, since I haven't defined Eisenstein series on subgroups, the easiest is just to define this one. It is, in fact, 1 over 240 times e4 of tau minus 28 e4 of 2 tau plus 63 e4 of 3 tau minus 36 e4 of 6 tau. So that function starts with 0, and then it goes on q, 14 q squared, uh, 91q cubed, and so on. So that I call g. But now this g tilde is what's called the Eichler integral. g tilde of tau is the same q expansion. It starts with q. But the next coefficient, instead of being 14, it's 14 divided by 2 cubed. And the next coefficient, instead of being 91, is 91 over 3 cubed. And the next coefficient, instead of, which I didn't even write, being 179, it's 179 over 4 cubed. In other words, this is the function such that the third derivative of it is g. Remember, my derivative just multiplies q to the n by n. So to integrate three times, I in differentiate by n cubed. 
That is what's called an Eichler integral. I would have to go much further into multiple forms than I did to prove the second part that it satisfies the right differential equation, which is now inhomogeneous. It's the same operator, but now inhomogeneous. But it does give the multiple connection. This thing has a completely multiple description. It's f times g tilde. g tilde is this Eichler integral. Now you immediately see, if you believe that, this part. Because if I go up to order 100, let's just take n to be 100. Well, if I go up to 100, g G has integer coefficients. So G tilde, the coefficients are 1 over n cubed, n going up to 100. So, I, so a common denominator of all of that is n of 100 cubed, the LCM. So if I make any change of variables, like between T and Q with integer coefficients, I will still only have that GCD as a coefficient. So it's obvious that this is true. And finally, to get the limit, I say that the limit, as n goes to infinity of Bn over An, is the same as the limit when tau goes to some sing singular point, which is a cusp, which I won't specify, of the generating function, over that generating function, you take the nearest singularity, which is at roughly 1 over 34. So t goes, sorry, t goes to the limit, which is roughly 1 over 34. It's actually quadratic irrationality. And then you have to divide this by this. But this is already this times something. So it's just g tilde of tau. But this, this singularity here in tau tilde just corresponds to g tilde of 0. And now, knowing things about Eisenstein series tells you that this is 8 of 3. So indeed, I, I, I would have said that if I had more time. Thank you very much for the kind question, for letting me say it. OK, I have a simple question. What, does it, what is known about Z of n for all the values of n? Oh, well, that has absolutely nothing to do with this series of lectures, because although things are known, to my great disappointment, none of the higher proofs have any connection with multiple forms. So we're in the wrong lecture room for that, but I'll answer anyway because, you know, we're friends. Uh, basically, very little. If I'm very honest, they've proved some wonderful theorems, but for instance, what, what certainly the two main things one would like to know, well, the first one was, is eight of three rational? And that up here re-answered, as I said, uh, now 34, 36 years ago. The next two questions, or how about z of 5? Is that rational? And actually, the, really, the question that Apiri should have asked, Euler didn't show that z of 2 is rational. He showed that it's a rational multiple of pi squared. Nobody believes that these are both periods. Rational numbers are periods of weight 0. z of 3 is a period of weight 3. And it's a meta conjecture that in all of mathematics, no period of weight k can ever be a period of weight k prime. Nobody can prove it. So it's not possible that this is rational. But it certainly would be possible, from that point of view, for it to be a rational multiple of pi cubed, because they both await 3. So the actual natural question is if z of 3 a rational multiple of, of pi cubed, or to say differently, is z of 3 squared, which is weight 6, uh, equal up to q cross to z of 2 cubed, which is also pi, you know, pi to the sixth. Well, to 100,000 digits on the computer, it's not true. Nobody can prove that. So both of these things are still open after 36 years. So of the three most basic questions, up here we answered one, and the others are, remain open. What was proved now by several people, all of my knows, well, Rifo Alla should say maybe is the most, made the most important contribution, and maybe the second most is Zudilin, but several people, the various theorems. What's known, nothing is known when you divide by powers of pi. But on this question of irrationality, it's known maybe z of 5 is irrational, is rational. Nobody believes it, but it could be. It's not disproved. Maybe z of 7 is. Maybe z of 9 is. Maybe z of 11 is. All of that's open. But they're not all rational. So it's known that of these four numbers, at least one is irrational. And more generally, it's known that if you take all z to n's with, with n odd, they generate an infinite dimensional vector space over q. So they, you know, they can't all be written. And it's effective. If you take the first 10,000, you can say that has at least dimension you know, 1,000 over Q. But it's very disappointing because they're all meant to be irrational. And anyway, frankly, nobody cares except to make themselves famous. But mathematically, this is not a reasonable question. This is the reasonable question. Are the z of n's over pi to the n irrational? And that's not even known for 3. So we know very little. And the little we know is not worth talking because it's not multiple. Thank you very much. Uh, don't so let's uh, think uh, done again. Yeah.